I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ken uh, Blumenthal, who is professor and chair at the Depart at the uh, School of Medicine uh, and uh, Biomedical Sciences, SUNY Buffalo. Uh, his talk this morning will be peptide uh, neurotoxin probes of ion channel function. Uh, Dr. Blumenthal. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about uh, voltage-sensitive sodium channels and how they work. Uh, and uh, the title here really alludes to the, to the fact that uh, we all, we've all heard the old, the old expression that one man's uh, meat is another man's poison. Uh, and, and, and this is a, a case where a variety of different poisons, and I'm going to tell you really only about one of them in detail, uh, has given us a lot of insight into how uh, uh, voltage-sensitive sodium channels function. And um, um, also has a, a good deal of potential for uh, giving us templates for designing drugs that modulate channel functions. So um, there are lots of different poisons that, that uh, and lots of different poisonous organisms that, that, uh, 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 that secrete things that modulate these channels, uh, from puffer fish to scorpions to anemones, various kinds of toads, and some interesting spiders that I'm going to be talking to you about later. You probably want to stay away from spiders that do things like that. Um, so voltage-sensitive sodium channels uh, serve many important functions, but most importantly, they are responsible for the rising phase of the action potential. And they function, and there are, there are isoforms of sodium channels that, that initiate action potentials and contraction in muscle, and that initiate action potentials in nerve. Uh, as you might imagine, there are, disease, there, there are mutations that are associated with channel malfunctions, uh, and these, uh, these have been identified now in at least four different classes of sodium channels. Muscle sodium channels uh, have a variety of mutations that give rise to periodic paralyses. Uh, cardiac sodium channels uh, have uh, mutations have been, have been identified that, that correlate to long QT syndrome, uh, Brigada syndrome, and a variety of uh, arrhythmias. Uh, CNS sodium channels, SCN1 and 2, uh, mutations in these have been associated with um, uh, uh, epilepsy and, and various seizure disorders. And more recently, in the sodium channel that's found in peripheral nerves, that's expressed in peripheral nerves, uh, a couple of diseases have been identified that are associated with chronic pain, with ability to sense chronic pain. And the, 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 the toxin that I'm going to tell you the most about today is actually one that, that targets this sodium channel. Uh, and there, there are a number of, of pharmaceutical companies that are very interested in how this toxin uh, modifies channel function. So here is the, the, the big, big, big picture of voltage-sensitive uh, sodium channels. So voltage-sensitive sodium channels are members of a large superfamily of voltage-gated ion channels. These channels pass selectively either sodium, potassium, or calcium in response to a change in membrane potential. Um, they all have a basic structure, which is probably pretty hard to see in this, in this slide, but if you look very closely, you will see that for sodium and calcium channels, which are shown up in this, qu in this quadrant, there are four domains, four homologous domains, and here's one domain of a voltage-sensitive sodium or, uh, or calcium channel. Uh, and what you can't see in this, uh, in this uh, rendering is that each of these domains has six transmembrane regions in it. So the whole protein has 24 transmembrane passages. Um, and that there's a good deal of internal homology, obviously doesn't show up in this, uh, between each domain. So we know that these things, are, we, we, can, we can deduce that these things are derived from a common gene by two duplications and gene fusions. Um, one of these six transmembrane domains in each, sorry, one of these six transmembrane passages in each domain has a very high density of positive charges and is thought to be responsible for, volt, for voltage sensing. Um, the whole protein is about 250,000 molecular weight depending on, on which channel and which organism and which uh, isoform we're talking about. So it's a fairly complicated protein to work with. Um, a, a simplistic view of, of how the channel functions, and I'm going to, I'm going to put the, putting this up here so that we can talk about all the various sites that are involved, and then I'll tell you about the, 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 the sites that we're most interested in. So the channel is a transmembrane protein. Most of its sequence is actually within the membrane. Um, it has a, a, a larger, we think, we don't, we don't have a three-dimensional structure of this channel, although we do have three-dimensional structures of some more simplistic homologs. So we think it's it has a wider pore at the outside than at the inside. And 
In the pore, there is a binding site for a, for a guanidinium compound called tetrodotoxin, which is made by pufferfish and which blocks the channel. So, so tetrodotoxin is a blocker. If you ingest uh, improperly prepared uh, sushi uh, that's made from pufferfish, it will kill you. Um, very quickly, actually. So tetrodotoxin is a channel blocker and it binds to what is called site one. There is further down in the channel a selectivity filter. So the selectivity filter is what determines whether this is a sodium channel, a, a calcium channel, or a potassium channel. So different ions are allowed through uh, with different efficiencies. Sodium channels conduct sodium about 30 to 1 preference over, over potassium and don't conduct calcium hardly at all. Um, there is also, below the selectivity filter, what's called an activation gate. So the activation gate is that part of the channel which undergoes a conformational change, the first conformational change, which causes the channel to open. And if you think of the channel as sort of an inverted teepee kind of a structure, what happens during opening is, is that the bottom is, is pulled apart so that the pore opens all the way through. And you can see sort of down here, you could imagine that if these two par parts moved further apart, this would open the pore. So there are toxins that bind to this site at, uh, called the activation gate at site two. There's an inactivation particle. So the channel has three states, open, closed, and inactive. And the inactive state is different from the closed state. So that after the channel activates, after these two pieces move further apart, they, they uh, generate, there is generated a docking site for what's called an inactivation particle. And the inactivation particle jumps up into, this, into the inside of the pore here and closes it off. And this is why uh, action potentials can only move in one direction down either a nerve or a muscle. So the channel becomes unable to fire for a transient period of time after it's been activated. Sodium can go through the channel as long as the inactivation particle is out of the way and the activation gate is opened. There are also sites on the outside of the channel, and I'm not showing you where they are right here, although that's what a good deal of this talk is going to be about, where peptides bind. So there are a variety of different polypeptides made, scorpions, spiders, anemones, that bind to sites on the outside of the channel, designated as site 3 or site 4. Site 3 is associated with channel inactivation. So when a toxin is bound to site 3, the in inactivation particle is inhibited from moving into the, into the inner part of the pore. And site 4 is associated with, activate, with channel activation. So site 4 toxins typically are thought of as peptides that change activation in some way. Usually, they make it easier to activate. We're going to see that that's not always the case today. So the pharmacology of the sodium channel, very briefly, is shown here. And there are a variety of different sites. And actually, there seem to be additional sites coming up all the time. Some of this is just due to, to inability to distinguish one from the other, uh, uh, particularly with some of these, these local anesthetics and things that bind to site 6, which are fairly, and 5, which are fairly hydrophobic. And it's, it's sometimes not simple to distinguish in binding assays or in functional assays between these. But certainly, site one, sites 1 through 4 are distinct from each other. Site 1, I already told you, binds tetrodotoxin, and it's in the pore. So the binding site is, some, is in the, the S5, S6, so the S the fifth and sixth transmembrane passages of each domain constitute the pore. Tetrodotoxin binds in that region. Batrachotoxin, which comes from these, these toads, uh, binds somewhere near the inside of the S6. And these two toxins here, C anemone and scorpion toxins, bind in domain four in the S3, S4 extracellular linker. Uh, beta scorpion toxins bind to the same region, but in domain two. These affect channel inactivation. These affect activation. Most of what I'm going to tell you is going to relate to things that affect channel activation. So the story today is how do these gating modifiers, so these toxins that I'm telling you about, these polypeptide toxins, are what we call gating modifiers. They change the kinetics of activation and inactivation without affecting the intrinsic ability of the, of the channel to conduct ions. So how do they do this? Um, and what we're going to see, I'm going to tell you most about this one here. Um, but in some cases, they'll involve protein-protein interactions. But it looks like in some cases, the interactions that are most important are not necessarily protein-protein. They may be protein-lipid interactions. So how do these gating modifiers work? So let's take the two extreme examples. Here is domain, a, a rendering of domain four 
of the voltage sensitive sodium channel. And you can see the six transmembrane regions here. The pore region is formed by S5 here, this reentrant loop, and S6 here. So when a site 3 toxin binds to the sodium channel, it inhibits the movement of this gating particle, of, of this gating uh, domain, there, thereby preventing the inactivation particle from, having, from, from finding its binding site. And electrophysiologically, what we see when this happens is that the normal uh, uh, current trace for an action potential, which shows an, a, a rapidly developing inward current followed by a rapid decay of that current, in the presence of a site 3 toxin, the current, the channel activates, so the current develops just fine, but doesn't turn off. So this is, this is the, the electrophysiologic hallmark of a delayed inactivation so that you can very readily measure the presence of toxin on the channel by simply measuring current at a time between 5 and 10 milliseconds after the initial stimulation. Normally, the channel, a normal channel will have no current at this time. A toxin-treated channel will have appreciable current. So that's a site 3 toxin. And this is a little bit confusing in nomenclature. The site 3 toxin binds in domain 4, I will remind you. Okay? Site 4 toxins. Site 4 toxins, unfortunately, bind in domain 2 to make things a little bit more complicated. Uh, but so here's a rendering of domain 2. And again, you see the same, remember these are homologous. Each of these domains is homologous. So here we see the same S4 highly, po highly positively charged region, uh, which is a voltage sensor. So when the channel activates in the presence, in, when the channel activates, this uh, helix is thought to move outward. In the presence of a site 4 toxin, it gets trapped in this outward configuration. And the, so the electrophysiologic hallmark, which I'm showing you in a slightly different format here, uh, this format is called a, a current voltage relationship. So a normal channel, an untreated channel, will have a current voltage relationship that looks like this, where maximum current uh, is at about minus 20 millivolts. In the presence of a site 4 toxin, which stabilizes this, this configuration of the channel, this curve is shifted to the left so that the channel activates with less voltage with less depolarization required. We can identify interactions in these, in these uh, toxin channel uh, complexes using a formalism called Newton cycle analysis, which was developed about 20 years ago by Alan Furst to look at, at enzyme substrate uh, complex formation. And basically, Newton cycle analysis just says you can measure, if you can measure the dissociation constants for the, the wild type ligand, wild type receptor, in this case toxin and channel. And if you can mutate one pair, in this case let's say it's the, the, the mutant is in the toxin, in this case it's in the channel, you should be able to see a dis, if you should be you should see a disruption in binding affinity, which you can measure by some some assay. Um, and that disruption should be more or less the same if two residues, one from the toxin, one from the channel, are interacting with each other and you shouldn't see any additive effect when you measure mutant versus mutant. We can do this in a, ch in a channel assay simply by measuring, if we're looking at a site 3 toxin, for example, we can measure current. Remember I said you could measure current at this, in this sort of eight milli, seven to eight millisecond time window. And toxin binding is strictly proportional to the current that develops in this time window. So you can watch the current increase with time after washing of toxin. You can measure that you can get a K on from that, and you can get a K off by just washing it out and measuring the washout. And it's a fairly simple assay. Um, and when you do that in a in a in a coupled in a in a, in a case where you're seeing uh, uh, a pa where, you, where you're uh, demonstrating the existence of a of a of a pair of residues interacting with each other, what you will see is shown here. So here is a wild type site three toxin binding affinity less than one nanomolar, binding to a wild type cardiac sodium channel in the, in the filled block. If you mutate a particular residue in the S3, S4 linker of domain 4, which is the binding site for this toxin, you decrease the affinity by almost two orders of magnitude. So the open blocks here are the mutated channel, uh, and the closed blocks are the wild type channel. If we mutate a particular amino acid residue, lysine 37 in this case, to an alanine, we find that we lose a great deal of binding affinity for the wild type channel but we lose no binding affinity for the mutant channel. And this is an indication that these two residues, aspartic acid 1612 of the channel and lysine 37 of the toxin form a charge pair. 
uh, we can actually use a, a, the Gibbs equation to calculate a delta delta G, and uh, what we see in that case is that it's about the, energe the energetics of this are about the energetics that you would expect for an, for a, for an electrostatic interaction, a kilocalorie and a half or so per mole. Um, this is pretty old data. We've, this was published almost 10 years ago. Now. Actually, it was published 10 years ago. Um, but this is the same formalism that you would use in general to look at at protein-protein interactions. Um, this was all done with a site 3 toxin, and it's the same method that we chose to address the binding of this new toxin that I'm going to tell you about for the rest of the talk. So about five years ago, we got interested in a family of spider toxins. Uh, so spider toxins, are, spider toxins are very interesting. They have an enormous pharmacologic diversity. Um, and some of that, this is a very small snip of what the diversity, the pharmacologic diversity of spider toxins is. But there are spider toxins that interact with virtually every kind of ion channel that's been identified to date. Voltage sensitive, mechanosensitive, acid sensitive, all of these things have not one, but families of toxins that interact with them. And some of these families are shown here. That, so they'll interact with potassium channels, sodium channels, calcium channels, mechanosensing, ASICs, and others. These toxins are all related to each other. And it's, it's interesting that these guys have a basic structure, so they're all co-evolved, um, and yet the only, th the, essentially the only thing that's conserved among all of these things is the disulfide framework that holds them together. Pretty much everything else in them is hypervariable. So Single spider venoms have between 50 and 100 related toxins as assessed by mass spectrometry. So single spider, one animal. Um, most of these are about between 30 and 40 amino acids in length. They all have three disulfide bonds. As far as we can tell, they lack regular secondary structure. If you do any of the, the sort of typical secondary structure determinations, you see pretty much they look like denatured proteins, but they're not. Um, and they have these three disulfide bonds that are always linked one to four, two to five, and here's one to four, uh, two to five, and three to six. So they basically form an, a, a knot structure. So ICK stands for inhibitory cysteine knot motif. The identified molecular targets I already told you, all forms of voltage sensitive sodium channels, all forms that we've looked at of voltage sensitive potassium channels, most forms of calcium channels, and several others. Some, most of these things are gating modifiers. Some of them are, are pore blockers. So they do of all kinds of things. And there are, estimates are thousands of these toxins for, uh, for which targets have not been identified yet. So what do they do? We started, and I should, I should give credit at this point to Jamie Smith, who was a graduate student at my lab, who is now a postdoc at NIH, who did most of the work that I'm going to show you about um, we started to look at one of these compounds called Protox2, and we find that Protox2, as an initial characterization, inhibits the activation of sodium channels, of voltage-sensitive sodium channels. So here, we're going to look at, this is our protocol, so for those of you who aren't familiar with electrophysiology, um, basically, this is, these assays are all done by whole cell patch clamp analysis, and there are two different forms, one of which holds the cell at minus 130 millivolts and steps it to minus 30 millivolts for 10, second, 10 milliseconds and measures the resulting current that flows. And that's, that generates what's called a train file, and this is a train file here, where no toxin is here, and as you increase toxin, current decreases. Okay? The other way you can measure this is by doing steps in 5 or 10 millivolt increments from 130, from minus 130 up to plus 20. Uh, and when you do that, you generate what's called an IV curve. And most of what I'm going to show you is generate the data are, come from IV curves. So here's an IV curve for a normal cardiac sodium channel expressed in hex cells. And you can see maximum current is, is at about uh, minus 30 to minus 40 millivolts. In the presence of Protox2, that's, the maximum current is greatly inhibited, so it's about 80% inhibition. And th there's a shift in the maximum uh, in, in the voltage required for maximum current to the right. So this means, what this means is that this toxin inhibits channel opening. Even though it affects activation, it does not stimulate channel opening as the typical site 4 toxins do. It inhibits channel opening. So how does it do that? And what's more, how, does it, how do we account for this? So here's, a, here's some data from, from uh, Charlie Cohn's lab uh, in which 
he looked at the effect of this, of this toxin, Protox2, on several different channels and finds uh, that it modifies uh, activation of virtually any, any sodium or calcium channel he looks at. This is a little unusual because, because these things are, although they're homologous, they're not that homologous. They're only about 20% homologous. Um, so, how do you, so we have to account for the fact that not only can this, this peptide, which has only 40, 31 residues in it, modify so many different channel isoforms, but it does so with a very high degree of isoform selectivity. So there's some specificity built into this. You notice here that the NAV 1.7 channel is modified at probably at sub-nanomolar concentrations, whereas NAV 1.5 is modified at about 0.1 micromolar. So there's a hundredfold difference here, and yet there's virtually no difference here, even though the calcium channel and the sodium channel are much more distantly related than these two sodium channels. So this is, was a hint that we missed, actually, that this must involve something other than protein-protein interactions. Um, so we set out on what seemed to be a fairly simple quest, which was to identify the binding site. After all, we had clones. We knew how to do site-directed mutagenesis. And the likelihood, the initial thought was, well, this must be, because it's modifying activation, it must be either in domain two. The binding site must either be in domain two, somewhere near site four. Or, because it's inhibiting current, it must be somewhere in or near the pore. So we started out, Jamie started out, by wondering whether or not Protox binds to site four. And the experiment that she chose to do was a fairly simple one, simply to, to mutate residues in this linker. And the way in which she ended up doing this was simply by swapping the linker in domain four for the linker in domain two. So she made constructs that had no domain two linker. And the construct that I'm going to show you the data for is this one here designated S4, in which the domain two linker is completely replaced. And then all she has to do in order to measure uh, activity is to say, does Protox2 still modify this channel? And that's shown here. So here's the IV relationship, current voltage relationship, for a channel, for a 4-4 channel, no domain two S3, S4 linker, uh, untreated and treated with Protox. And pretty much what you can see here is the pro it looks like the effect of Protox is pretty much identical on the 4-4 channel to what it is on wild type channel. And more extensive data bear, bear that out. Um, and now you want to know, as a control, have we really succeeded in abolishing site 4? And in order to test that, Jamie took a known site 4 toxin derived from centroides, from scorpion venom, uh, and demonstrated that this toxin, which normally will do the same thing as Protox, now has no effect. So site 4 has been abolished, but Protox activity has not been abolished. Therefore, Protox cannot bind in domain 2, S3, S4. Okay, we said that was one candidate. The other candidate is the pore because of inhibition of current. Does it bind in the pore? Um, so the answer to this, unfortunately, is no. Um, and the way in this, which this experiment is done is as follows. Again, we're looking at IV curves. So here's the IV curve of the normal channel, untreated with toxin. We throw on Protox at 500 nanomolar. We shift to the right. We inhibit current, just as we expected. And we then ask, what happens if we give the channel tetrodotoxin? So tetrodotoxin is a pore blocker. It binds in the pore. If Protox binds in the pore, it ought to inhibit tetrodotoxin binding. And we ought to see no inhibition when we chase Protox with tetrodotoxin. But instead, when she chases Protox with tetrodotoxin, the channel is completely wiped out. Channel activity is completely wiped out. Therefore, tetrodotoxin can access its binding site in the presence of Protox. Therefore, Protox shouldn't be binding in the pore either. So now we are in sort of the head scratching stage because it's not in either of the two likely places. So now, how do you, how do you, where, how do you proceed from here? We're dealing with a peptide. The peptide is fairly positively charged. So the notion is it must be, the binding site must be in some other extracellular linker region. So in order to test this, Jamie made a, a large, I, I would say a, an heroic number of mutants um, in extracellular linkers. And I'm not going to go through all of these, ex except to say that in all of the S1, S2, and all of the S3, S4 linkers in the sodium channel, we have been, she was unable to detect a binding site for this toxin. So notice that all of these different mutant constructs display inhibition 
by protox. The degree of inhibition varies a little bit. Part of this is due to the, to the difficulty in working with some of these mutant channels. But the bottom line is that all of these things um, behave as though they have a complete and intact binding site. So at this point, we said, well, there must be something unusual about this. How can we, how can we, can we come at this from the other side? Can we come at this from the toxin side and maybe get some insight from that? So because Jamie has, had by this time gotten very good at doing mutagenesis, she then did an alanine scan of the entire toxin. There's only 30 residues there. You can't mutate the cysteine. So it it's really boils down to only making about two dozen mutants. And what's shown here, and you don't have to worry about what the numbers say, what's shown here is the result in, in terms of KD values for all of these mutants. And the red ones are the ones that are important. The red ones are the ones that have a major effect on binding affinity. And if you look at what the red ones are, methionine, tryptophan, methionine, valine, tryptophan, leucine, tryptophan, most of them are hydrophobic. There are a few, there are a few polar ones. There's arginine 13 and arginine 22. But other than that, Virtually everything that has a major effect on binding is hydrophobic. And this is a clue as to what's going on, we think. Um, what's more, when you look at the, and this probably doesn't, doesn't show up very well, but when you look at, at where these things are on the, on, a, on the solution structure of the toxin, they all map to one face. So everybody that seems to be important maps to this one side of the toxin. And what's more, these residues here, glue 17, serial 11, threonine 8, and some others that are not shown here, which do not have an effect on binding affinity, all mapped to the other side. So we now have sort of a, a, an amphipathic kind of molecule that's got a very clear hydrophobic side to it, and, a very, and, and that side is important for activity. So the question then becomes, does this toxin access its binding site by first going into the membrane? Or is its binding site really largely lipid-derived? And so Jamie devised an assay, uh, a liposomal assay, and it's a very simple assay. You simply make uh, PCPS liposomes, uh, incubate toxin or mutant toxin with these things, spin the liposomes out, and assay toxin in the supernatant by HPLC. So it's a, it's a simple depletion assay. And the results that you got are shown here. So let's start at the bottom. So here's a typical site 3 toxin before and after liposome treatment. And what you can see is that the site 3 toxin is not depleted by treatment of liposomes. So before, I can't remember whether the solid line is before or the dotted line is before, uh, but they're the same. Protox 2, notice, is completely depleted. There is no Protox 2 left in the supernatant after treatment with liposomes. So it's completely soaked up by the liposomes. And what's odd, what, what, what became odd about this was the next set of experiments. So we now said, well, these are pure peptides. Suppose we take a whole venom that we know contains different kinds of toxins and ask, is there some discrimination between toxin classes in terms of whether or not they'll bind lipid? So on the left here is uh, venom of the, the scorpion Lyurus. On the right is the venom from the scorpion Centroides, which we received from Luravel Pisani in Mexico City. And we do the depletion assay. We characterize each of these peaks by mass spectrometry, compare it to the known molecular weights of, of toxins that exist in, this, in, this, in, this, in these venoms, and then assay selected fractions for their activity. And what we find basically is there's a site 3 toxin, a known site 3 toxin that runs right here. It has, this peak has exactly the same mass, and if we assay the contents of this peak electrophysiologically, we see a site 3 type effect delayed inactivation, inhibit, inhibition of inactivation. Here, we see one that is completely depleted. The one that's completely depleted turns out to be CSS2 by molecular weight and CSS2 by electrophysiology. And so what this is telling us is that site 4 toxins, things that affect activation, seem to bind lipids efficiently. Site 3 toxins don't. And what's more, what makes this even more confusing is that the, the site 3 and site 4 scorpion toxins are structurally related. And you can, see, you can see that sort of here. They all have this helix and sheet motif. You can't see all of the sheet in this one because of the way the molecule is oriented. But there's a three-stranded beta sheet with an alpha helix docked against it. These things behave differently when it comes to ability to bind lipids. Whereas these things that have no structural similarity and these things that have no structural similarity behave the same when it comes to binding lipids.
which suggests that there may be a difference, some fairly subtle conformational differences in the domains of the channel that are most associated with activation and inactivation. And I'm going to just skip this one uh, because what we did here was to make a number of, of mutations in the transmembrane regions to see if we could find a site, and the short answer is that we did not find a site. So we are left with a model that looks like this, where, the, where, where this little diamond-shaped thing is protox. And what we think may be going on here is that protox binds to lipid initially and then either diffuses by, laterally within the membrane to access a binding site which we have not been able to identify on the channel itself, or by immobilizing annular lipids in the vicinity of the channel inhibits the ability of the channel to activate. Remember, activation involves outward movement of this S4 helix. So that if you put enough energy in the form of depolarization into the system, you can get it to activate. But normally, under, under, under normal voltage conditions, it won't activate. Um, so we're still working on trying to figure out that whether this model that has no direct interaction between the two proteins is the valid model, or whether uh, there are sites on the, on, the, on the channel that interact with the toxin as well. And it looks like there are, but we don't have good enough data yet to, 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 to uh, reach that conclusion. So basically, this is an interesting toxin because it modifies two different channels that are distantly related by homology. It modifies them with very high affinity and with very high isoform selectivity. It doesn't interact with site 4. We think it, it will therefore allow us to identify new sites that are important for gating transitions. Its binding interactions are mostly hydrophobic, and they could involve transmembrane, and, and probably do involve transmembrane regions of the channel. And there's probably some composite interaction with phospholipids as well. Uh, this toxin, remember, has a very high affinity for channels involved in sensing chronic pain, and is therefore a reasonably good target in terms of uh, 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 templating for drug design. And with that, I will close. I thank you. I think I probably ran a little bit long. Uh, so the people who did the work, uh, most of the work was done by Jamie Smith, who graduated uh, last summer and is now in Ken Swartz's lab at NINCDS. Uh, she was assisted in some of this by Sujith Alfie, who is still in the lab. Uh, collaborators, we have a long-term collaboration with Dottie Hank at the University of Chicago, uh, Ted Cummins uh, at, at IU, and uh, Laura Valpasani and Gerardo Corzo in Mexico City. So thank you. Thank you.